Three, two, one, hello. Um, trying to um, work out these lectures on various topics so that you can see how the moving parts fit. Um, and this section, this lecture is on finding inspiration in your city. I don't know what where you are now. Um, um, today I went to the Met, one of my favorite museums of all time. Been there hundreds of times. Um, New Yorkers, you can go there paying what you want to pay. If you show your ID card or whatever. I paid five bucks today. Uh, and a friend. Um, so... It's, uh, this is a section on, um, on uh, inspiration, um, finding it not just in magazines and other flat sources, but going to certain places to look for inspiration. Um, very important in a young and an old life, the spectacle of cultural work and, and making stuff and welding it and painting it and... <clears throat> uh, photographing it and having it curated so it shows up in a show. Very important. Um, and you might also think at this point, oh my God, there's, he wants us to do everything. This class is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we have so much to do. I don't know if we can get around to do it and all of that other good stuff. The answer, quick answer is yes. Um, but I want you to develop a pattern, a habit of being curious about your city. Um, all of you people, um, I want within this six weeks, um, some of you, all of you, take the train into New York City, fabulous town, um, and go to some of the museums and some of the galleries and, and be curious and see these things if you already haven't. Um, and and um, trying to find inspiration from being alive in your society, your cosmopolitan center, is, I think, important. When I went today, um, the, 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 uh, one of the shows I wanted to see was the fashion show, but the line was humongous, and, and the amount of walking you do in the the museum I think I got my 12,000 steps today um, uh, so it can be tiring you're there with three dimensional forms you're there with kind of a zoo of historical artifacts um, uh, hopefully not forgeries um, some works are priceless beyond price um, so we got in and basically saw the um, Charles Ray show, a contemporary artist, will show you some of those things. And um, Winslow Homer was a show I liked very much. Um, a, a painter who worked in uh, oil and watercolor and traveled and, you know, things I do, things that are favorite of mine. Uh, traveled from Maine down to the Caribbean traveled overseas, um, uh, tried to see this Darwinian relationship of humankind with nature, the destroyer, um, and was quite adept at painting these subjects. Um, further on, um, and then walking through the various halls, I'm always inspired by what there is. There were a couple... Um, interesting there was a new period room devoted to a future afrofuturism um pretty interesting space as they have all of these other period rooms that are very interesting in terms of entering into a space almost like a a, a escape room in themselves um, it was a hot day, 91 degrees. Um, everyone got out of the sun. Um, the roof deck was closed. And here is the part I want you to incorporate in becoming a cosmopolitan esthete, 
epicure, erudite individual trying to develop your own language of quality, a, a kind of adopting what the canonic or the um, uh, r uh, kind of a, a curated list of whatever in your life and trying to pursue that um, to greater or lesser extent um, in order to be a well-rounded individual. So this is my attempt to um, forge these for you, with you, um, in w f with the museum. Okay, let's make this little film outside the Met. Let's watch that. Oh, uh, sorry. There you go. I'm sitting here at the Met outside. Uh, it's a continuation of the lecture on um, how we use museums. How do we? How are we stimulated by what we see, where we go, culturally? what is going on in order to sort of influence our work and what in our work would be influenced um why how um the world seems pretty big that there are so many influences and rabbit holes we talk about falling down rabbit holes that could inspire our work where do we begin how do we say this is it this is complete how do we make a lifelong passion of going to museums or theater or seeing good criterion collection films and basically having a, a erudite um, epicurean life and curating um, not only what other people think is good but also what in our own language our only ability to tell ourselves what is good, um, develop a, a type of voice about um, what we're seeing. So today I'm going inside the Met and um, I'm going to export these films, these little films, talk about what I do when I go to a place like the Met. Uh, we're at Stony Brook and we're pretty lucky that we're... Um, close to all these wonderful, wonderful museums. Now, the, the counter-argument is, yeah, this is a bunch of Western imperialist culture, artifacts, objects, things that represent forms of oppression, forms of, of wealth, um, uh, non-distribution, uh, uh, evidences of the crimes of the West. Um, in artistic form, yes and no. Um, can we uh, look for beauty outside the context, the political, psychological context? Um, this is open, um, but the alternatives are, um, I don't know what the alternatives are. Uh, uh, going to gallery shows, especially in a large cosmopolitan center like New York, the tri-state area I've read is the largest confluence of interconnected urban settings um, itself. Uh, so I try to go to the museums, uh, two or three of them a month, um, try and do the gallery crawl every Thursdays. I have my own circuit, try to see shows at uh, BAM, Brooklyn Academy of Music is, is a favorite, the Armory. Um, I try to uh, hang with this Epicurean, uh, uh, erudite Epicurean sort of mindset. What is that? Again, we say the canon. The canon of dead white guys was, is nothing to fully subscribe to. Uh, we have to take it with a grain of salt, understand influences, but again, as I said in earlier videos, uh, a love of good theater, love of good museums, love of a good book, love of a good movie is starts with a confidence, kind of a confidence in your culture. As a culture that has been in, in just at times uh, represents stultifying hierarchies, oligarchies, um, but we have to trust that we are kind of in the game, um, and that's 
where I want to leave off with this video. We're going to go inside the map. Let's go further outside the famous stairs. Once again, we're in front of the Met, um, a world-renowned museum. Uh, later, I'm taking classes to the Uffizi in um, uh, Florence, um, the famous steps of the Met. We're going in to see, I think they've got um, a couple of shows I want to see. I want to see that fashion show. I always enjoy the period rooms. Uh, the artifacts, the Greek Roman, the Pompeii rooms. Uh, it's um, it's a wonderful thing. You New York natives, you can get in for suggested prices. Um, what else about this? Um, they have a, a degree of modern art too, which is all always enjoyable at the Met. Uh, so it it attempts to span. Uh, not just history, but the discourses of um, of art history. Um, incredibly fecund and stimulating place. So uh, I'll take still photos inside. And further, um, so the exterior of the Met. Um, we started with the Charles Ray show upstairs. Um, uh, we'll go through a couple of these. There was one more video, um, here, and then we'll go back. Um, the facade is designed by McKen, Mead, and White. It is, um, a neoclassical tradition, kind of over the top, inspired by the Roman uh, architecture, obviously to portray some sense of empire like, like they were. And let's go backward. So we're going back into um, a couple of the things I saw. I saw a um, uh, Charles Ray show, a kind of a conceptual artist from the 70s, went into these larger forms. Um, uh, th these realistic cast things out of metal. Um, I'm looking at the relationship of the space to the artifact also. That's very important. I've designed a few museums. Um, that's always a pleasure to work on those sorts of endeavors. Here's a couple views from the side. Then saw the, um, the uh, Winslow Homer show, walking through the galleries themselves in a full day. Um, iconic view of the stairs. And into, I think it's starting me with Winslow Homer. Let's see if I can pop this larger yeah uh, it's not quite fitting our piece but themes of the sea uh, people women strong women against the sea the elements this notion of of nature and the elements other animals against human beings with nature against a nature kind of this this um, rock, paper, scissors configuration with nature being a strong and dominant, dominating force. Um, human beings in there somehow as hunters, as people with a relationship with nature. And then um, uh, animals who are on a scale with human beings often suffer the consequences of nature, the, the weather, the hurricanes, the storms but are also um, hunted by humans. Boats, this notion of boats, he hung out on seacoast. Much of this is oil painted, some is watercolor. This is the iconic stairs of the Met, just to soak up the, the spaces, soak up the meaning of the spaces is a wonderful thing 
to do at the Met and as they configured many spaces. I told you before I am a 3D freak so when it comes time to making three dimensions I don't hesitate whether it's clay which has this interesting beauty and utility um, it's got this chemistry behind it um, it's a vessel it's god awful old I don't know five six ten thousand years old um, uh, baking wet clay was discovered to make it harder and contain uh, have this vessel like attribute making objects too sculptures and objects here was a, a delightful show in the Met on the just uh, what was it called finding perfection and imperfection or the joys of imperfection all of these slab and very crude statements in clay I enjoyed it here's a weird wonderful little lineup of things going on here kind of a house type thing in this glazed blue clay um, this circular thing very very strong gestures very important strong gestures that were put out there um, uh, by modern clay artists I guess I don't think there was anything old here but um, I had to snap that stuff um, delightfully there were a number of people sketching in the Met today kind of an old guy who was really going at it in the American section with um, realist uh, sketcher draftsman um, with a pencil holder and a piece that big um, here's more of the lineup more of these weird wonderful bizarre clay structures um, that are very inspirational to, to myself to see these things in 3d are so much more wonderful off pages or websites um, it's kind of like making a pilgrimage in the heat, um, trying to find water somewhere at the Met. Now that they've turned off all their water fountains. So this notion of a pilgrimage, going to see something, being there, walking, riding, subway train taking, biking, uh, flying there, um, is part of the, the ritual experience of all of us. So showing up at these places is extremely important um, and seeing these things. The Met never disappoints. I really like how eclectic it is. I like the MoMA, I love the Frick, but they're redoing the Frick. I think that moved to the old Whitney, which is a, a beautiful, um, uh, God, who a Breuer, Breuer building, brutalist, um, wonderful, beloved. They move that Winnie down to the edge of the the High Line. Many, many, many mu smaller museums in New York. The new museum. I would like you all to pick a museum out of the six weeks to go to, if you're taking this class in the New York area. Um, uh, one of my first trips as a as a young person to New York, I went into the Met and it was a kick in the ass. It was really amazing. The Spanish courtyard, all these period rooms that are just up. They had a show that was coming down of Jacques Louis David, the famous uh, revolutionary painter who painted all these epic themes on canvases but his drawings on con with Conte Cran on paper were very interesting very um, um, uh, you can see how these individuals work up to a, a, a painting of uh, the scale to which David worked um, heroic themes composing bodies all of this is very interesting to me um, just the meticulousness it took to line these things up the meticulousness it 
takes to understand the human form. Um, uh, in going through the museum with my little Samson S20, which has a fairly good camera, just clicking these off, it, it come to kind of a little bit of a realization. I can click, I can suck all this stuff out and, and regurgitate it to you guys. Um, or I can draw it or I can think about drawing it, or I can look at that ceramic and say, I can do it. And I open up my sketchbook, and which I want all of you to have, and um, take my notes. Um, uh, we talked about in the last video about maximizing and satisficing. Um, I want you guys to satisfy to say, this is here, this is now, I'm doing a sketch, I'm doing a drawing, here's what I'm putting into the space. Um, some of these photos had, you know, there's a kind of a logic to the Met, but I think they change it up all the time. There's old stuff, god-awful old stuff, such as the Egyptian stuff, I mean, great stuff. Um, then you move through the Native American and Oceanic and, um, you know, it is kind of eclectic for an American col a collection, not totally unlike the Smithsonian, but the Smithsonian has a number of museums. I was just in the art and technology one. Um, they switch it. They switch it up, they change it. So by the time we got to uh, the line in the American wing about going to the, the fashion in America, um, it, was, it was a long line. And um, after walking through the Met, you get, you know, you need to be um, athletic to sometimes go through these places. Here's one of the American wings. Um, uh, uh, not the, the Petri of Paul. Um, a lot of work was done on the Met in the 80s, 70s, 80s to revive it. Here's one of the second floor galleries, third floor galleries, one of their permanent collection. If you haven't ever been to the Met, um, certainly take a couple days. I really enjoy uh, seeing, and I'm fortunate enough to have been to many of the major museums of the world. Um, one of my favorite was the Egyptian Museum in Cairo downtown, which I saw during the revolution. Um, and the building right across from it was burned. Um, uh, they were very, very much worried that a spark or a flame would jump on the museum and burn it down. Um, there had been some looting of the museum too, um, but it was an amazing museum. Um, no photos allowed. Um, uh, but when I go to a foreign city, I try to see the museum just to, you know, not do the touristy thing, to understand where the roots of a culture are. What are the roots? Um, a lot of these paintings were acquired by the so-called robber barons from um, from uh, the Civil War onward. Um, the Carnegies, the Mellons, the Rockefellers, the, the Fricks, the, the, the individuals who had, could make tax uh, deductions by giving to cultural organizations. Um, and they also wanted to create, uh, at least on their managerial classes, an educated populace that would be able to walk through these spaces, see the idealism portrayed by the paintings, um, uh, the finesse, the craftsmanship to which each individual artist devoted themselves and it was an agenda to forge a new country built on some of the roots from um, Europe. Um, we go on, that's my beach today, biking back. Gorgeous, um, the Charles Ray show, um, getting into the Winslow Homer, 
I looked at, and, and now why am I doing this for you guys? Um, go to a museum, just go to any museum. Um, go to many museums in your life, but please, if you haven't attended a museum in um, New York in a while, the, the, the Guggenheim, the circular Frank Lloyd Wright Museum, um, I asked this question of um, Stony Brook students every semester, and I'm saddened to say that there are many places that these students have not belonged to. This is, this is your dog whistle. This is your entry into what's left of middle class culture, to have some sort of um, frequency with these places to catch shows. Um, uh, uh, extremely important. Uh, again, Winslow, Homer, watercolor, love the mastery to which he applies watercolor um, in um, uh, the, um, the lineup. This is in Cuba. Sorry, I think I got throttled here a little bit. Um, this is uh, the, the, the storm, the sea, showing the power of nature. Um, a, a, an abandoned boat in the Caribbean with sharks floating around it. Um, again, kind of this triangular relationship between uh, nature, animals, and humans. Um, what, who, who is faring better against the forces of nature? Um, he has often of his scenes of the Caribbean having um, uh, individuals shipwrecked after uh, uh, surviving a hurricane and then having to survive the sharks. Um, an individual on the shore after a hurricane. Um, just these are beautiful, beautiful watercolors and oils portraying um, heroism, yeah, the, the, his draftsmanship and the bodies are incredible, but to, to show the tension with nature is um, always there in Winslow Homer. And, and look at this application of, of color theory, color dynamics. He's got the blues against the reddish browns of the skin, um, uh, which create this very um, bold um, dyads, triads in, in color theory. Um, and then his trips through Jamaica, the Bahamas, um, uh, Cuba, has an individual basically living up in Maine and going south or north or south in the winter um, over the sea down to these lush tropical settings and then painting pictures of them. Um, at a time where um, photography was fledgling, um, individuals turtle hunting. So I'm making you design spaces, and here we see individual things. This beautiful signorina in a background somewhere in Cuba, um, applied with watercolor. And you might be asking, okay, whatever, this is not a travelogue, just focus. I am focusing. Um, I'm hoping that you use a museum on a very intuitive level first, that it, you have a gut reaction to it. And then there's another shot in Cuba in, in uh, watercolor. Um, you have a gut reaction. You have a, a intense curious reaction. Um, I'm just so saddened and sickened by blasé attitudes from young people about any of this, that this is um, the cultivation of curiosity that museums can somewhat do, um, somewhat create, are, are immense and, and wonderful. Um, more watercolors with a beautiful, beautiful composition and tonality and showing the 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 um, the clouds with the base with her white dress a very heroic very fresh very um, very buoyant a wrecked ship up in Maine um, this room had all the 
the the bath holes in it so you could see other other framing the gallery so you see other people at a distance um, uh, I find it very interesting that way um, his time on the New England coast I say I think mostly Maine his time in a fishing community in northern England um, against uh, again the torments of the sea this very heroic scene of two lifeguards rescuing these women from the water um, um, again uh, uh, he was very intent on metaphor building up metaphor saving people out of the storm um, I guess according to one of these things he had read Darwin in this uh, notion of survival of the fittest against the, uh, the nature was one of his um, concerns um, so I walk through in the various rooms various period rooms here's a scale model of the Temple of Solomon and it's kind of funny that these things exist everywhere tucked away in corners of the Met it's a huge labyrinth um, here's one of the period rooms and um, it is um, what about them they're very very complete very stiff and very showing off a upper middle class upper class sort of demeanor I've been up to uh, Newport and walked through some of those uh, museum houses same thing very elegant living um, uh, some of the tools are all there in interesting physical culture I did not get into an anthology of fashion, but here's the iconic um, a gold Artemis shooting her bows, gold Diana, I think. Um, but, 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 they brought some of the fashion into the Frank Lloyd Wright House from Wayzata, Minnesota, that was going to, for some reason, be torn down, and the Met said, no, 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 we'll take it will turn it into a period room so these Midwesterners couldn't tear it down and they um, eventually moved the interior rebuilt the interior in the museum and then for this show they had um, I'm back on um, for this show they had um, put the mannequins in the space and put these very, very elegant uh, uh, dresses from the, the tens, twenties, and so forth into this space. Um, here's the view. Um, so, um, kind of in conclusion about this museum, and here's a, uh, an urn from the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo that um, Frank Lloyd Wright designed and had built back into the courtyard. Here's the funky uh, period room of Afrofuturism. Very, um, a comment on the very um, bougie, staid, stoic, um, uh, upright, middle, middle, upper middle class, upper class rooms of period rooms in the Met. And the, this is a period room devoted to Afrofuturism, very detailed kind of riffing and spoofing on that idea of the period room in general. Um, there's a number of great ones in the Brooklyn Museum. That's another museum I'd like you to put on your list. Hopefully you go to one of the museums for your time, but this is uh, also on your list. And this was an interesting, very eclectic, eclectic room. Um, you could view from two or three sides, filled with American Africana um, uh, iconography from uh, African existence uh, a comment on again the comment on the stage stodgy bougie rooms of um, of the period rooms already there uh, they have a couple Chinese rooms upstairs too it was fun it's the first time I saw it I don't know if this will be permanent 
uh, there's a general philosophy that, uh, and when I was very young, I, well, out of college, one of my first jobs was to work at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts and Museum. Um, great first job, didn't pay well. Um, hanging out with art all day long, assembling it, preparing the rooms, um, thinking of configurations. Um, there was a philosophy, and then I would go up to the storage room where it's just filled with stuff. So a bunch of museums, a couple in Berlin, a couple in Europe have a reversed philosophy. Um, and certainly in the, in the, the visible storage room in Brooklyn Museum is we should get it all out, no matter how we can categorize, how we can um, create a, a way of categorization. Um, we should just get it out. It should be out there. It should be out for the audience to see. It should let them make sense of it. And I'm sort of that way in life, that, that um, taxonomics are something you can do on your own time, that um, the way the world has created taxonomics for you, sequential orders, can be overridden by just going in here and experience and making even making the connections between the spaces. Um, more of that, uh, more of that. Uh, the artifacts alone are stunning and intriguing. Back in the space, Winslow Homer, Winslow Homer. Each each one of these things with the animal is caught the animal in the tension of working with nature against humankind or on their own. This is a fox in the snow. And right and left were, I remember hearing way back when I was, uh, one of my first trips to New York, just listening to a docent talk about this painting. So you can see there, there's a guy with a flash of a gun. It's as if Winslow Homer's out in the range of the gunfire or the trajectory of the shotgun with birdshot you can see the the blip of water from shot hitting that we have um one of the birds struck by the birdshot from the shotgun and one of the birds escaping and in his own Taoist way um winslow homer's talking about what what lives and what dies, at what second, at what um, traveling the coast of America down to, from Maine to the Caribbean, passing over that dangerous graveyard at North Carolina and doing some work on the coast of Europe. Again, always interested in nature, a portal, a portal into a world, a portal with the conscious artist looking back at human beings um, killing some of these birds for food there is one that escapes it's called left and right where where we see one dying and one remaining in life um, we see the nature of the water we see human beings on the water and we see an attack um, so we have in this we have all our tensions we're running around the museum with our limited funds and limited times here on planet earth and we're doing the same thing what lives what dies what what should i be interested in what what should i have curiosity about um and what can i let go um uh, uh, we're overworked we're over we're on a conveyor belt these paintings are about um here's a boy trying to hold a drowning buck up um that maybe he shot and there's his dog and i don't know how winslow winslow homer heard about these stories and tried to set up the relationship to these um with models i'm not quite sure but he's piecing together stories of uh, this. This is the very famous painting of a Jamaican surviving a hurricane, but maybe not surviving the sharks. And back behind him is a water spout, which talks about the 
fragility, but also the strength and the tenacity of human consciousness. And the, again, the interplay, the swirling interplay notion between nature and um, nature, culture, animals, as not quite nature, brethren to human beings, but adversaries, um, and so forth. And that is about it for today. That, again, a little homily at the end. Um, these places are to elicit curiosity. Um, that was a quick how to use a museum. Um, the mat being one of the best ones to use. Go in meditating, uh, uh, looking for co answers to questions you have, questions for my class, how to make a space, questions for your life. How do I survive nature? Um, how do I thrive? How do I um, take a moment and reflect, as in this painting? How do I see beauty? How, how do I develop um, an Epicurean self? This is one of the um, brief and major things I wanted to impress, I, I had an overdeveloped sense of curiosity. I have limited amount of times, but I did have a overdeveloped sense of curiosity as a kid, which I think is beautiful. It tends to put you down rabbit holes that get you labeled as dreamers and unpractical people. Yes, I'm extremely pra practical, I think, but I am a vacuum cleaner of, of, of curious things. Uh, maybe it's because of how I grew up. I grew up in the woods of, of Minnesota, which created kind of a tabula rasa, much like these pa these paintings. Um, it's a machine. But out of that curiosity, I think what was next in my mind is to develop a sense of Epicureanism. Um, if I can enjoy, if I can find solace, regardless of what work is doing, what relationships are doing, what things that are not really in my control, I can go to a museum, I can look at these things and see other subjects who are dealing with things out of their control, um, surviving, not uh, uh, maintaining a heroic sense, um, having heroic artists work their lifelong craft making these things um, visible to us. Uh, so that's how to use a museum. Um, this is a wonderful town for that, New York. Um, keep doing it. Uh, it's a ferocious town. It's an expensive town. It's an exhausting town. It's a Return to the dangerous town too. It's used to be only top, not even in the top fifty most dangerous cities. Now it's getting back up there. Um, but um, to develop the Epicurean, the refined, the the aesthetic, and uh, to develop into an aesthete, an Epicure, an erudite individual, these are. These are personal goals, and these start with curi almost a naive curiosity and refining your voice. We talked yesterday about the meeting between Salvador Dali and Picasso, just showing him the sheer volume, his voice, his need, his drive, his passion to be an artist. You can passionately enter a museum, not be so blasé. Maybe it'll get you out of the blasé. I am very depressed when I see a blasé young person. Um, and this is my little medicine to get you out of that. Go to a museum. And this is the how to, uh, how to use a museum. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.